Um, the purpose of this part of uh, the meeting is to have an engagement with representatives from mixed race Irish regarding their experience in state institutions. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Ms. Um, Carol Brennan. You're very welcome. Thank very you. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Yvonne Brennan. And uh, I think you're mixed up there, according to the names of the thing. That's fine. And we'll fix that. And Ms. Rosemary Adassar. Adassar. Your we can swap chairs if you like. Would that help? Would that help? Would that help? You want to switch chairs? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. so I, I can't see it. I, of course. Y Yvonne is here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's, that's, yeah, thanks. That's fine. It's only a small thing. Now, the uh, purpose, the format of the meeting is I will invite you in a few minutes to make some opening remarks of about five minutes, or thereabouts each, or whatever way you want to do it. And this will be followed by a, a question and answer session with members. Um, uh, before we start formally, I want to apologise for the delay. It was unforeseen. There were um, issues in the Dáil Chamber, which were, in my time here, unprecedented and uh, something we didn't foresee, which delayed matters for today. But anyway, we're here now, so I apologise for holding up any, any inconvenience caused to you. Um, before we begin, I, I want to draw the attention of, of witnesses to the situation in, in relation to privilege, and this is quite important, so I'm going to read it out to you. I think you've got it already in your, in your documentation from the clerk. Please note that you are protected by absolute privilege in, a, in respect of the evidence you are to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, um, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons by name, or, or an entity or either, or an entity, by name, um, in such a way as to make him, her, or it identifiable. That's quite important. And members should also be aware under the salient rulings of the chair that members should not comment on or criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So now, who's starting off? Carol, you're most welcome. I invite you to make your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, we would first of all like to thank the committee for this opportunity to come before you today to discuss the experience of our members whilst in the care of state institutions, detailing any inequality in treatment based on race. So who are we? We are a campaign group called Mixed Race Irish. We wish to raise awareness of the experience of mixed race Irish children who were in Irish industrial care system during the 1940s, 50s, 60s and 70s. These children were mostly of African fathers and Irish mother heritage. We want to highlight the racism and the damaging impacts, legacy, experienced by these children whilst under the care of the Irish state. So why mixed race Irish? This is actually a very important question as it reflects the importance to us as a group of our Irish heritage, which we believe was stolen and denied to us. We grew up in Ireland and to all intents and purposes are Irish, yet we, f we believe we were treated differently, resulting in inequalities in treatment in these institutions because of one simple factor, the colour of our skin. We were formally set up in September by Yvonne Brennan, Rosemia Adasse and myself, Carol Brennan. We came together at industrial abuse group gatherings. At these meetings, we realised there was no understanding, in fact, room for debate or support for the colour specific racial suffering that was imposed on us as children and the impact this has had on our lives. Our existence and experiences are unique and we believe have been airbrushed from Irish survivor abuse history. We have, in fact, identified over 70 mixed race Irish survivors of institutions. We now know there are seven suicides in our community. We believe there could be over 100 people who are either unidentified, missing or deceased. We are continuing to search for these individuals, which is actually a difficult task, given no records of mixed race Irish are apparently available. Our group to date has 40 members and growing. We are located in Ireland, Britain, America and China. 
Members of the group are all over the age of 50 years of age. Our membership is approximately 40% male and 60% female. And some are here today in the public gallery. Now, there is strong evidence that some members of this community have had serious mental health problems, substance abuse, for example, drug and alcoholism, social isolation and intergenerational issues relating to racial abuse and poverty, which we will come back to later. So what are the aims of our campaign? Number one, raise the awareness of our color Pacific abuse of mixed race Irish by reaching out to others and sharing our stories personally and also publicly, like what we're doing here today and where appropriate. Number two, recognition and acknowledgement of how the state failed mixed race children in institutional care. Number three, justice through accountability and redress and how the state should provide for its failure to protect mixed race children in its care. And number four, assurances that the issue of racism be prioritized as a state initiative to ensure that these kind of abuses do not happen again, in particular in state-run institutions. I'd like now to read a collective statement on behalf of the Mixed Race Irish Group. And I'm just going to slow down here for a second because it's slightly emotional, okay? It has taken us many years to have the courage to reveal the depth of our inner pain and suffering which has been actually internalised. This has been made possible by us standing together as a collective group. The sharing of our horrific past has given us the strength to bring forth a long and well overdue past which we feel needs to be exposed. Many mixed-race Irish carry deep scars of trauma and continue to suffer as a direct result of these past experiences, which have left huge and everlasting wounds that may never heal. As highlighted in our submission point number one, the Constitution of Ireland states that all children of the nation are to be cherished equally. Our submission will reveal how the state failed mixed-race Irish children through inequality and discrimination. Our suffering manifested, for example, in the following mental health, identity, opportunity that is actually intergenerational, poverty and income. Many of our members present with mental health problems which have had a devastating impact on the lives that are actually ongoing. I'd like now to read further examples of painful disclosures from members in this regard. I was forced to clean block toilets on the grounds that my colour was the same. Bath time as a means to inflict degrading racist sexual inspections. Being doused in tal talcum powder and told, now you know what it's like to be white. Many of our members have lived with a lack of identity, which has had a huge impact on their sense of self and belonging. An unconscious hatred of our black heritage that was ingrained in us by the institutions, matched by exclusion, where we were made to feel unwelcome, unwanted by Irish society. The failure to accept mixed race Irish as part of Irish society, with no recognition, no ethnic protection, is devastating. Indeed, how can children protect themselves from, from this discrimination in the absence of race policies and legislation? Wanting so much to be Irish, to belong, that this constant question of my identity was so traumatising, no one attempted to explain my dual heritage. A white survivor observed that he knew his mixed-race Irish friend was being treated unfairly and very badly, and he didn't understand why until years later. He believes his friend now to be deceased. A study from Howard University in Washington, D.C. points out that parents' responses to their own experience of racial discrimination may influence their parenting and how they teach their children to successfully negotiate racism. One member recalls being told by their psychiatrist that despite being highly intelligent, they're only using 10% of their mental capability due to trauma of racism and lack of identity. This is a devastating realisation. Many mixed-race children's fathers, as outlined in previously in our submission, were educated to high standards as student doctors and engineers. In secondary school, the parish priests would single out mixed-race children and racially abuse them in front of their peers, telling them, for example, you have two drawbacks in your life. One is the colour of your skin, and the second is you are illegitimate. There was a kind of pecking order, and, and coloured girls were the lowest in the ranks. No career planning or work experience because of the stereotype that we would become prostitutes, resulting in many not living up to their full potential. There was a lack of trade, was extremely damaging to my survival post-institution, and employers told me outright 
that they would not employ a nigger because I would scare them. And those, those statements actually are not my words, they're reflections and, 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 and disclosures that have come privately through members. So without protection, guidance and support regarding identity, we entered adulthood feeling inferior, resulting in low self-confidence, which affects jo both job prospects and lower educational outcomes. And finally, I would like to refer to this as outlined in our submission. A certain amount of coloured children were seen in several schools. Their future presents a problem difficult of any satisfactory solution. Their prospects of marriage in this country are practically nil, and their future happiness and welfare can only be assured in a country where a fair multiracial population, since they are not received by either black or white. They are also at a disadvantage in relation to adoption. These unfortunate children who are frequently found hot-tempered and difficult to control. This is actually a report sent to the Department of Education in 1966 by a doctor. As highlighted in our submission paper, points 3-1, page 4, and I quote, we recognise the language in the above statement to the Minister of Education. We consider this language deeply offensive. This is a language that made mixed-race Irish children the other in Irish industrial schools and encapsulates the racist labelling that ensured our childhood were filled with terror, abuse and pain. And finally, it is our hope that we commence the process of grieving for a lost identity, youth and heritage that can only truly begin through recognition, acknowledgement and justice for the suffering of our members, mixed race Irish, whilst under the care of the Irish state. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, um... <laughs> Um, I wanted to um, thank uh, Deputy Ferris for bringing um, these issues to the attention of the committee and the office. I, I read through um, the doc all the documentation um, prior to the meeting, um, the last number of nights, and I must say uh, it's extremely moving. And I can see why uh, you paused earlier on. It's very, very, very disturbing. Um, Deputy Ferris, you, you want to ask some questions, make some comments? I do. Thank you, Chairman. And first of all, I'd like to welcome Rosemary, Yvonne and Carol to the meeting uh, here today to the Justice Committee. Um, I met with you earlier in the summer um, and we had a good chat about, about your situation and the situation of people in the mixed race Irish organisation. Um, I suppose as an adopted person myself, I'm acutely aware um, of the of, of I suppose the problems and the traumas and the identity issues that, that people who have been adopted are, and I have worked a lot and I've spoken a lot to people, both in my situation and, and people who were sent to orphanages and mother and baby homes, and I've listened to a lot of stories. And I think really what, you know, for you, you have an extra layer of discrimination on top of what other children and other, you know, well, they're adults now, felt uh, when they were in these homes. Um, I was uh, born, I was reared in Crumlin in Dublin and we had our own um, person in that situation who became quite famous, Phil Linnett, as you, you know, the singer. And he spoke quite, uh, you know, he was quite vocal about the discrimination that he suffered in school um, and the fact that he was never really accepted until he became a celebrity and then suddenly, oh, well, it's cool, you know, he's fine. Um, and I think, you know, listening to your 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 story there, um, Carol, which you outlined very clearly, um, I can identify with an awful lot of what you say. And I think this is another aspect to the whole situation that hasn't been examined and hasn't been looked at and should be included in all investigations. And I think when I was speaking um, in July on the on the debate in the Dáil on the Commission into the, uh, of Investigation into the Mother and Baby Homes, I actually mentioned your organisation and I put it on the record. Um, I would like to ask you now, and I, you know, I, I, can, I know the, the answers to, to this question, but I want, you, I want to put it on the record, my, my question, and also your answer. Um, really, why are you bringing this to the attention you know, uh, to, to the attention of the Justice Committee now. Why are you highlighting in that, it now? And how have you overcome your tragic history? 
Thanks. to answer that question. Carol. Thank, thank you, Anne. First of all, personally, on behalf of us, we'd like to thank you for your personal comments and raising this, this issue in the Dáil at that time and on record. It really means a lot to us. Um, and obviously, there is certainly an identity. You, you reflect very much what we experience and that extra layer, which obviously only of us can, can experience. But I'm going to pass this question on to my colleague, Yvonne, to answer, if that's OK. okay. Thank you, Deputy. Um, my name is Yvonne Brennan. I am a co-founder of the Mixed Race Irish. And we are bringing this to your attention today because we can no longer tolerate the racial suffering to continue being airbrushed from Irish history. It has taken us five decades to talk about our colour specific um, sufferings and together we now stand as a collective voice, a voice which is no longer isolated in our sufferings. We are bringing our past racial sufferings into the present to be looked at to be learned from and our painful histories be documented as evidence to show how Ireland dealt with racism in the past and how it currently deals with racism today. As so many of us share identical stories of colour abuses endured because of our skin colour, we can say this was a reality. In the first instance, our voices were listened to by TD Dominic Hannigan. Several years ago, his generosity and his willingness to give us time further motivated us to raise our campaign on the horrific suffering endured on mixed race children while in industrial care. Through talking and listening, we opened up a can of worms that shocked us as a number of mixed race stories echoed of detrimental racism, such as neglect, starvation, poverty, sexual, physical and verbal abuses due to the colour of our skin. The second part of your question, Deputy, how have we overcome our tragic histories? I believe to overcome one history of horrendous colour specific abuse will take years and many of us may never recover from these traumas. How do we overcome the inherited belief our fathers were savages from the jungle and our fathers were of low intelligence to later discover our fathers were students in medicine, law, civil, civil, engineering, civil engineering, and excuse me, and contributed to Irish society? How do we overcome the shock of this knowledge was deliberately withheld from us? A deliberate lie, a cover-up, to discredit our innate intelligence and our heritage. How do we overcome deep feelings of inadequacy and inferiority? I would like to talk briefly on a personal, personally about this. I overcame temporarily, and I believe to overcome takes years of difficult therapeutic work, and this avenue is extremely long and painful. I overcome by becoming an expert in control, in my music, in my family life, and socially being isolated, to mask the deep sense of hate and worthlessness I felt inside. Deep feelings of inadequacy and lack of belief in my own talents is a loss of my capacity to, to contribution to society. So I'd like to ask the committee here today, you were presented what you were presented with today, that um, to go beyond that, because what you see are three individuals who appear intelligent, who appear confident, articulate and self-assured. This is how we have learned to behave. This is how we have learned to be, to be accepted. We've learned on the surface level, keeping at bay our stunted past, yeah. our capacity for greatness on a surface, our capacity for greatness, and especially and fundamentally our inability to endure lasting deep love. Um, these feelings of isolation are not in isolation. They are a common thread among our community, as is the physical, physical, the wealth of physical suffering that flares up. We are here, we are in suffering. Any new situations throw us into suffering. Simple questions, where do you come from? can invoke flashbacks, throw us into helplessness, confusion with racial identity and deep, deep depression. Our interiors and our minds are not functioning as well as a cherished, loved individual. 
So how do we overcome our past will be an ongoing battle and struggle for us due to the inflicted racism and abuses experienced in our traumatic childhoods. But being here today is the beginning of our recovery. And thank you for listening to Thank you very much. Deputy Ferris, further question? I, I know, and thank you for that, Yvonne. And, you, you know, I, I, I know you got upset there. And, in fact, I get quite upset when I listen to the stories and um, as well, and I can empathise with you. Um, but believe me that you three women are very, very strong, strong women. And even though, and it, you know, I have my own issues about identity and, you know, uh, feelings like that, but at the same time, like yourselves, it, I think it never holds you back. It makes you stronger and makes you more determined. And I think it's very, very important that you get your story out there and to address the injustice that has been done uh, to you, as I said, mentioned about the, the extra layer. Um, I know you've carried out a lot of research into the effects of racism. And I just wonder, could you tell us a little bit more about your findings uh, from your research? Good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Adasser. I'm one of the founding members. One of the things that we observed when we all came together, we wondered, we needed proof, we needed some kind of evidence, as much for ourselves as to convince the wider public that our intuitive understanding, that our experiences were racially motivated. And we wanted something to evidence that. And we did our little research, but no surprise, there's nothing really about us. Um, there's a plethora of civil liberty organizations in Ireland, and they're very worthy, but we don't actually exist. And the only documentation there is about us merely refers to us in denigrating, insulting terms, such as the one Carol outlined in that letter to the minister. So I believe the research that we carried out is the first of its type. Uh, we started off from just the three of us, and then we now, as we now know, we've got 72 members in our community. 56 of those members have very proudly shared their experiences of institutionalized racism in Ireland. And we have the results. They are disturbing. They are, it doesn't surprise us, but I think the scale of it is what surprises us. So, for example, we, have, we discovered, for example, 11% of us, of those 56 uh, 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 mixed-race Irish, have died early, uh, between the ages of 22 and 45. And they died early due to suicide or ki a killing. Um, we now know that seven of our members committed suicide. That's just not right. It's... We're, most of us are in our early 50s. These people commit suicide. That's just not right. Um, we then look at... Oops. One of the things that actually really struck us as well was that when we interviewed everybody, sexual abuse was a dominant factor. 44% of our community will admit to sexual abuse. And that's those, those, those members who are prepared, who, are, who have reached a certain amount in their healing to be able to articulate the trauma. Because for many of our members, as Yvonne has pointed out, they will never be able to articulate their trauma. Um, the next statistic was, was that 35% of us have enduring long-term mental disability and or substance misuse. Um, all of us will admit to having trauma in varying degrees. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the problems as well, of course, is 9% of our young men were incarcerated. And I think I wanted to put the context there. It's that when you are a, a, a mixed race and your education has been neglected because, you know, you're a savage, you're stupid, so we're not going to educate you. And as a young man, when you rebel and maybe you steal 
uh, from a local farmer because that you've been farmed out to that farmer to work for free so you say well where are my wages so maybe you'll steal a couple of his apples but you find yourself in front of the judge who simply step, he, he simply sends you to an institution a young offenders institution a number of our young men had that experience and then of course they emerge from yet another institution and what hope do they have they are ex-offenders they're mixed race their education is stunted so really how are they supposed to be educated and to work in society for those of us who miss that little bit it'll be fair to say that we emerged from institutions oh gosh such low self-worth it's so people talk about self-esteem it's like yes go and read your self-esteem book but m most people don't seem to understand that in order to have self-esteem you have to have a concept of who you are that's your self-worth that's who you think you are inside well we didn't have that so we emerged into the world completely lost knowing we weren't wanted in this society and it's doubly tragic because when you're in employment we knew that we were never going to be safe and i think that in a country that still refuses to ratify all the anti-racism laws i think that's really tragic so we never felt safe you know and i think i would the only thing i would ask would be for this committee to please Start, we are an indigenous group. We're not migrants. We're born here. We have members approaching their 80th birthday. We didn't arrive yesterday. Please start including us. And can we get the CRD sorted, please? Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I also, on behalf of members, take the opportunity to welcome the people in the public gallery who have joined us today. Your presence is appreciated and you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I may come back at the end. Deputy Cochrane Kennedy. Oh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Rosemary, Yvonne and Carol, Carol, you're both, all three of you are very welcome here and uh, the rest of your group. Um, it was my pleasure to meet you during the summer and I want to acknowledge the uh, efforts that uh, Deputy Hannigan and Deputy Ferris made in making the rest of us aware of uh, your organisation and your history. And while it was a pleasure to meet you, I was sorry that we were meeting in such circumstances that you had such a, a tragic story to tell us about your history. And um, I must say I was deeply moved and shocked uh, by uh, the stories that you told. And, um, I suppose, you know, when I mentioned it to other colleagues, and you know, people really, really are not aware about this, and it's a story that we need to talk about. Um, on top of all of the other sad, tragic stories, but yet it needs to be heard, the same as all of the others did too. Um, and I suppose, you know, I've read your, your submission and having spoken to yourselves, um, your experiences were truly appalling. Um, and maybe you might like to go a little bit more into uh, how your experiences were different to your peers in the institutions. Maybe you could expand a little bit more on that, please. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to, to Yvonne. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Deputy. Um, our stories are the proof um, our racial sufferings were compounded and uh, um, had additional burdens placed upon us. As our report clearly is detailed, accurate and particularly evidence-based and has taken us two years to complete. Racial injury is different to the injuries that other children experienced in the institutions. Um, old research shows the mindset of missionaries who went to Africa during the 18th century to civilise the barbarians. Our research suggests it was the mindset in Ireland while we were in care to control us hot-tempered savages, to tame and civilise us, our temperaments, and to get rid of our blackness by dousing talcum powder on us. Our research shows there was no person qualified in race relations, there was no programme set up, or any attempt to discuss our history. This shows immediately an indifference to mixed-race Irish. 
So we are adamant not to devalue the sufferings of other children who were raised in institutions, but our racial sufferings are unique and specific to us. And as explained, it's not possible for us to give specific details as this is too traumatic. Each time we bring this into the open, we open ourselves to the horrors of our past and we, do, we wish to minimize our, this trauma in this setting. So we will not be able to give the details in detail because it is too traumatizing for us. Thank you. And then, as I said, we have we've read some of the research. And yeah. I concur. One comment, yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry, um, Chair. Um, it's a really good question, Marcella, actually, because it's a, it's a question that we do often get asked the comparisons and actually one of the things we, we were keen to do is actually not to try and compare ourselves to white survivors or any, you know our peers what they went through what we, what we didn't go through as we don't believe our pain is worse or less in that sense but it's specific um racism in and of itself causes a lot of psychological issues which are far-reaching and that that's all i i, I would like to say on, on that Okay. You can't see it. Sorry, yes. You can't see. Can't see. You can't see it. And um, I would say the difference is you're raised in an institution, and what happens is so you have you can leave if you are white and not be identified as being raised in an institution. Um, being mixed race, you leave knowing you've come from an institution, but you also have the extra burden that it's physical that you can see it and um, that is a reminder when we are asked who are you where do you come from it throws us back into a past injury which is you cannot get over and it's um, it takes years and years of, of therapeutic work and some of us we never we never reach that level of being um, completely comfortable in our skins due to what happened to us. And just uh, another question, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, what steps can we take to uh, help you in terms of recognising what you went through and helping to, um, I suppose, I can't, I can't find the right word now, but to, to help you really. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Deputy. Um, I'm going to answer that question, Chair, if yeah. that's okay. Um, I mean, this is, this is a quite a huge question. Um, obviously, in our submission paper, we have outlined clearly some of the things that we would potentially be looking to for our members. I think the first thing is actually recognition. Because without recognition, it's like in order to grieve for something, if a dog gets, get, you know, gets, if your dog gets killed, you need to grieve for it. But before you grieve, you've got to acknowledge that he's dead. I'm, I'm just using that as, as, as an analogy. And that's what we're talking about here. And I think it goes back to that question of years of internalization of racism. And I can tell you this, and I want to share this with, with the committee. For me personally, to actually say I was targeted because of the color of my skin is something actually that I refused to acknowledge mm. for years. I did not want to actually say the reason why that nun did that to me or the reason why that priest did to me or the reason why that, why that happened to me in the street or whatever was because of the color of my skin, because it's too painful. And in fact, you ask anybody who's been subjected to racism, they often kind of want to go, no, that was because of my color. Some people will go, will try to say everything happens to them is because of their color, because of, of, of whatever. But in our cases, and particularly in my case, I can only say it was the other way. I did not want to acknowledge that I was different. And when you grow up as children thinking that you're the same as everybody else and then people, you walk down the street and the nuns are behind you and you get people coming up going, so where are these children from? I mean, I remember myself when I was very young and that question being put to me by Americans. And I recall this and it was very, it's actually, it's quite a traumatizing experience because the nun, I, I, I was very rude to the Americans. I told them to go away and stop annoying me because why are you asking me where I'm from? It's obvious I'm Irish because I was very proud of being Irish, I can assure you at that age. I, was, I loved Irish history, I wanted to speak in Gaelic and everything. And so being asked, and what did that nun do? She just whacked me across the head and said, back, and just put me up in my room, um, in the dormitory, and I would sit on my bed to think about my behavior. And I sat there thinking, I've just stood up for my Irishness, and, and, and this, is, this is what I'm getting. You know, this is, this, this, so, so the reason why I'm using this is because this is about acknowledging 
So if you don't acknowledge that what's going on and no one explain, if someone had explained to us the very simple thing, listen, you have two heritages, you've got an Irish mother and you've got an African father, and explain very simply some of those issues, it would mean that even today in a taxi or wherever I go in Ireland and somebody asks the question, where are you from? It's not going to be so, it's, it's going to be fine because I have I have some, some place to, to put that. Because no one explained it, it means every time you hear that question, you remember those Americans have been smacked across your face because you, were, you stood up. So, so that, that's really key. We're not saying, we can't blame anyone for asking us where we're from because we don't look Irish, let's be honest. Come on, we don't. But that's not the point. If you know your identity and know who, what you are, it means when the question is asked, you're able to deal with it. When we're asked, we, we had it today in the hotel where somebody asked us the question. We both look at each other. What do we say? What do we say? Because that that goes back to that very original trauma where where you were, when the question was asked because that nun beat me and told me whatever. So 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 it's it's really really it sounds like a, a superficial thing to say, but it's actually very very deep. This idea of identity, this idea that not knowing where you're from or what you stand for, or who you are, you're based on the color of your skin. No one's explained anything to you, so it stays with you for the for, for the whole all of your life. And I have spoken to other mixed race Irish who said when that question is asked, they want to, they want to lash out and hit someone. Because it's like, why are you asking that stupid question? So, so coming back, sorry, so just, just coming, coming back to your, your question about what do we want? Recognition. That's got to be the first thing. We need the recognition. And this is part of that process. We're here today. We believe, and we want to thank you. We don't take this for granted. We don't think that we're owed anything. In, in, in that sense. We want to thank the committee here for the opportunity to come and talk about this because we haven't talked about it ourselves for years. We've just hit it. And by raising awareness, and what Rosemary said about the CEO, CEOD, this is also part of it because racism is ongoing in Ireland. And we've heard stories of the cyberbullying of that particular boy that was, you know, committed suicide. His mother believes because he was he's mixed race and he was being bullied. And so in, in, in a sense, it's ongoing. And if we can in some way, you, there's an opportunity for us to come here today, raise awareness of what happened to us, but also, so it impacts potentially on, on what's happening today in Ireland. And if someone, if, you know, rectify whatever treaties that maybe are outstanding, you know, look at some of those issues so that you, people are protected if there is ongoing racism going on. And if, if people don't, don't know where to go with it and, and do I go to the police, if I go to the police, doesn't, does, the police is not going to take that seriously because there's nothing in your legislation that protects someone. We weren't protected. So, you know, it's, it's, we'd like to think that we're, even though we're talking about our experiences, that they will have a, 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 wider, a wider impact. And, and in terms of how maybe the, the, the Irish government could do, first of all, acknowledgement, recognition. Um, but there are a couple of things that we potentially could help us. We're completely self-funding. We, everything that we've done since we've gone together, in fact, we've been together for over two and a half years, you know, we don't have any funding at all. Um, and we want to continue, particularly tracing other mixed race Irish. There are quite a lot out there that, that we know are, are isolated and, ha and, and have not come forth. We want to be able to find a way of reaching out and, 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 and getting access to, to those people that are isolated. Um, in particular, one of the things that we particularly would be interested in, because it's a symbol to us, one of our mixed race friends committed, was found dead in the River Liffey, and she was 22 years of age, and she's now buried in an unmarked grave in, in, in Dublin, in, in, in Glass, is it Glass, Glass, Glass Nevin. Nevin. And she symbolizes for us how her life basically started and ended. And actually, she was someone that I grew up with with us, yeah. and I know Pauline was beautiful girl, stunning looking girl. And she was unloved and wanted and made to feel unwelcome. And I think she ended up dead in the River Liffey. And she's now in a marked grave. And she's a symbol to us. So if there's any way potentially that we could, through yourselves, your members, the committee, whatever, to investigate how we could potentially raise her profile, symbolize that by giving her, I think, the dignity and the respect that she deserves because she's unmarked there. Yeah. And in fact, a few of us tried to find her, we couldn't find it. So what does that tell you? So that's certainly something. I mean, obviously there are other asks that we put in there, but I don't want to go into too much detail. I'm sure you can read in your own time. Obviously this is a beginning perhaps. Uh, can, can I ask, have you uh, in, engaged with any other state agencies or bodies or gr groups at all uh, on this issue or these issues before you came here today as such? Um, we have here, there's 
I'm sorry, just trying to think of the name of the uh, organisation that we did contact here. Here, there's, there's this few actually, Rosemary. You were in touch with a few, the homeless, the homeless, because we we're trying to identify different how we could identify. Uh, uh, not at, at kind of a formal government state no, level, no. As such. No. No. Okay. No. I mean, it's one of the things that we we hope to go on potentially sure. is perhaps. Well, the, you, you actually. Um, you actually started your contribution there by thanking us. Can, can we thank you for coming here today? I mean, it's, it's, it's the other way around, I think. Um, okay. Sorry, you. get your cock in your, your done, yeah? Yep, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Senator Zappola. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for coming. It's um, uh, good to meet you, Carol and Rosemary, again, and to meet you, Donna, for the first time, and, um, and also to welcome the others. And um, I think my colleagues have already thanked you and, um, and acknowledged your contribution to us in a very uh, eloquent way to recognize your own eloquence. So I want to just echo their comments already. And um, I, 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 and also to say, you know, I, um, I asked a couple of your members, where do you come from today? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and in, and in two uh, beautiful women sitting up there. And in doing that, I, I did, uh, I, I understand what you're saying about that question, because even in asking that question of them, I, I felt, um, uh, what did I feel, I suppose, I, I, I felt even myself uh, a, a discomfort in asking that, an acknowledgement of, are you really Irish? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, but I, so I did, that's just by way of acknowledging what you're saying there, and it's perhaps the uh, internalizing of, you know, of, of th those attitudes uh, towards you um, that I just uh, acknowledge in myself. And so, the, and I also hear in, in a lot of your, of what, what you've presented to us, how your own work for in, with yourselves has been to challenge that internalizing of you as those who have been oppressed and, and, and just um, suffered so much in the way that you've described. So I guess what I want to, I just have maybe uh, one question, but before asking that, what I want to say as a public representative, as just as an individual, I recognize you as Irish. I acknowledge the suffering that you, just at least what I've heard today and when we met earlier. And I hope that you get justice. Um, I, I, the, the question that I have, I suppose it's just more, more, more practical because actually some of the other deputies asked a couple of things I wanted to raise, but just wh where did you, um, how did you meet and, and how did you get started? And it'd be good for us to hear about that because I've heard you ask us to help support you continue to grow, but just what are the origins maybe? Thank you. Chair, I'm going to ask Rosemary. Rosemary. Yes, thank you. Um, as Carol said, we, we met about two years ago at um, Irish Survivor, Women's Irish Survivor Network meetings. And I remember the very first time I went to one of those meetings, I was very scared because it was a survivor network for Irish women and I felt Irish but I was very scared that I would get the inevitable side on glances and what you're doing there sort of thing. Uh, on that occasion they were very nice to me but what was so exciting was that at the grand old age of 56 I met two other mixed race Irish women, Yvonne and Carol. I was born and bred in Ireland. I left in my 20s. And two years ago was the first time I had ever met a mixed race Irish woman with my history. My history. Nobody else's. Mine. And we came together and we thought, well, hold on. And, and of course, the, you know, Yvonne and Carl were equally surprised that they haven't heard about me. And I'm actually older than they are. Not by much, you know. Let's keep it in proportion, but I am older, and they've never met with me either. Um, and and then we had we had coffee, so we'd keep going to these survivor meetings, and we'd have coffees, and it kept coming around to so tell us about yourself and where were you? And I was gobsmacked when I realised that they were over in Sligo. I mean, who goes to Sligo as far as I'm concerned? But then we found out that we had people who lived in who lived it, you know, who were in Mayo, who were in Drogheda. But what was really important, on a much more serious note, what we, what we realised was that increasingly, when we shared our stories, we realised there was a common thread. There was a common thread. And we realised that it didn't really matter whether I was in Kilkenny or somebody else was in Drogheda. The pattern of behavioural treatment to us was so consistent. 
So we decided then to uh, uh, sort of move on to the next part. We basically, word of mouth, we contacted the people we knew, uh, who contacted the people they knew. We held a couple of meetings in London and a couple of meetings in Dublin. Um, the biggest issue that we identified was actually our isolation. I mean, I alluded to the fact that I hadn't met anybody like me before, but it was the isolation that was so important. And when we came to Dublin, it was so moving because it was the first time members in the gallery had come together as a community. We'd never met each other. They, they too had never met each other. And it was the first time we'd sat around a table and looked at each other and we felt a connection. There was no where do you come from question. Mm -hmm. We felt a connection. I looked upon my sisters and brothers, they looked upon me, and we didn't have to say an awful lot, actually. And we looked, we just carried the same pain. I think that was the thing that, that really struck us. Um, and I think for, for that meeting, what we realized, we recounted stories of, for example, the nuns showing films of missionaries going to see the savages. And we remembered being told, that's what you are. Not about raising money, and this is the good work we're doing to raise money, but no, look at that. They're savages, that's what you are. And this symptom, or this, this, this kind of insult that we grew up with from age zero to the day we left Ireland, was so common for all of us. This whole kind of, you don't exist for us. A couple of things that we realized as a, the new community, is that we've never been accepted by Irish society. We've never felt safe in Ireland. That's really important. Um, we're not confident of the same protections as, in law as other Irish people. We don't have the same rights to health, wealth and social capital as other Irish people. And the vast majority of us have not fulfilled our true potential. There's such, a there's such a commonality in our experiences. They're all racist. That's basically w what we're talking about. We confirmed that this racism was endemic throughout all the institutions attended by our community. It was quite a, it's quite extraordinary revelation to, re to realize this, how pervasive the pattern, the same pattern of behavior towards us, infants, children, adults, ran right across Irish society, starting in the institutions. And there was a clear pattern, and it could only be explained under the internationally acknowledged concept of institutionalized racism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Senator, uh, Deputy Kennedy. Sorry. Yeah. Kenny, sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Gohirlik. I'd like to welcome uh, Rosemary, Yvonne and Carol to the committee. I haven't met you before. Um, certainly, you, you have given a, a very harrowing account of uh, your childhood and people of your generation um, who spent their childhood in, in institutions. And I think that's a chapter in Irish society that was very shameful. Uh, it has come out in the open and people recognise that now and um, were conscious of it. You, of course, had a, had a double difficulty because you, you suffered racial abuse as well as the other types of, of treatment that was meted out to, to orphan children. And um, wh what I'm concerned about is, um, from your experience, the level of racism today. Sometimes in my constituency, I will get uh, parents who have mixed, uh, parents with mixed children, mixed race children, who say that their children are being abused in the street. And there have been, from time to time, assaults on people mm. of mixed race. Now, I don't know whether that is a declining, or I, my own feeling is that it may be declining. Um, when I was listening to you there, uh, I remember in, I was a member of Dublin City Council in 1990 when the freedom of Dublin City was given to Nelson Mandela. And that year, 1990, was the year when the Irish football team were doing very well, and one of their star players was Paul McGrath. So people of mixed, mixed race, in, uh, mixed Irish, uh, have excelled in sports and in music and uh, modelling and you know other mm. careers. So, so that there is that side of it as well. 
Uh, what I would like to know from your experience, do you feel that enough, you know, that there, there's more awareness uh, of the, the question of racism and, and how it's a despicable form of, uh, of behaviour, mainly attributed to public to ignorance? And um, do you think that enough has been done to ensure that we can we have to, can reduce this kind of treatment and, and that people of mixed race Irish should be better integrated into into our society? Yeah. 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 Ye
we, if you look at if you look at our, our, our colleagues here, all sitting in, in, in the gallery, and I look, I, I, it's, to me, this is the most group of people I've seen in one place, in a place like the Dáil, mixed race Irish. Unless we were here today, you wouldn't know that these people existed. So it's kind of a, it's kind of because of, of of being brought up in institutional care, we had a disadvantage because of the way we were brought up because of how our identity was kind of thrashed and the lack of identity. So it, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because you want to be positive and say that Ireland has moved on and I believe it probably has. But for us, mixed race Irish, we, it probably hasn't because we're still left with that legacy. Mm. I think that's the only way I can answer, answer the question. Open discussion is very important. Having, uh, having an open discussion yes. and yeah. having a discussion which reveals the truth and having a discussion which bears the reality of what happened and not being frightened to say this has happened and this is the only the only the way forward is to return to a past that is horrific and i believe the way forward is not to highlight success and say look how well we are doing it's to go back open discuss this happened this is the effect of that what are the effects of long-term racism? That is how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Collins, Chairman, and um, thank you to the group for coming today. And I met you during, I think, just before the summer, and um, I found it very interesting. And to, for you to, um, I suppose, remind us here again today of um, your experiences it's quite uh, levelling, I have to say. Can, can I ask you, in terms of the supports that have been made available to you out there, um, can you just expand a little bit on that? Is, is there any, or what, um, for example, NGO groups or support groups um, make themselves available to you or have made themselves available to you? And um, just if you could share with us your, your experiences on that. Thanks. Yeah. If I can answer that, Chair. Please do. Okay. Um, there is actually very little support, if, yeah, if, no, if to be no, really. No, no. <laughs> I mean, we have the organisation Karen which I'm sure you're aware of, that's been set up to support in general um, the survivors and, and, and actually have are benefiting our community and also not just us, but in general survivors. Um, I myself, I, I have an MSc in psychology and health and I have my own consultancy that specialises in. Um, in, in coaching around, particularly around trauma and particularly around trying to empower and move people on in their lives. So I, I, this, this is something that's, that I'm very passionate about. And actually what I, what I discovered is that I do also advocacy. There is a huge lack of support, particularly for mixed race Irish. Um, well, my, my colleagues are saying none, so I'm trying to be slightly. There's none, there's none. There's none. Um, and so there is very little, none, in, in, some, in some respects. Some of the work I'm doing is trying to identify some of those gaps um, and trying to, to, to get funding and whatever I need to be able to, you know, support. So in terms of NGOs or whatever, um, the difficulty is, is the lack of awareness of what it is to be mixed race Irish. The lack of awareness of it is to kind of, well, you know, um, if people are isolated and have complex needs. I support a number of mixed race Irish some who are in care homes, some who have severe mental health problems, suicidal, and I have to work with those individuals. I go into care homes supporting people who may be in care homes in the UK who are mixed race Irish and have no, no support, no mechanism, and it's a huge, huge issue. And I suspect here in Ireland it's probably the same, if not worse. So it's actually part of the work that we would like to do would be to potentially look at ways that we could not only necessarily to identify people with complex needs who have to mix race Irish, but also how we continue to support that, that community through empowerment and, and moving forward. And it needs to have, I think, a specialism in, in that area. It can't just be anyone, you're an NGO right now, come on, yes. we're going to be working yeah. together. So that, that's key to us that we, we, we because, you know, Rosemary has an, an, an MSc, we, we've actually educated ourselves from leaving Ireland. We went on, we pulled ourselves up, and we went on to educate ourselves, and, and we have actually achieved things in our lives. And we're using what we've achieved in our lives through our own work and our own mm -hmm. grit to support, and this is why we're here today, so we could actually help others yeah. who, are, who, who may not have, have, have the, 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 the fortune to be able to, 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 to move forward. That is certainly one of the things that we want to do. And we, 
we are, we are starting to do it, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And, and as I said, identifying and tracing some of these people who are isolated with complex needs that are out there is key. And those that we have identified. So I don't know if that's your question. No, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Could I say something? Of course, like that? Yeah. Um, As a mixed race Irish group, I believe that we are the ones who really know about our issues. Mm. And we are the ones with that experience, first hand experience. So I would imagine the best people placed for support and giving that support, I would imagine. Um, obviously, on, on, there's different levels of psychological levels, but I would, I would imagine as a protocol, or a, we would be the best people placed to mm. be able to, to identify mm. with that. And we are doing it um, on our own steam. Mm. And it's very difficult because each time we attend meetings, it put, we, we go back and there's a, a, a gap in our... Um, we, have take, we need time to rest because it evokes the past. Mm. Um, so there isn't any support there for us. There is not support that we need for us, for our members, mm. and for, for the unknown. I think it's the unknown. We don't know how we are going to be when we leave here. We don't know the impacts of how our mixed race community are going to be because mm. they have never, or we have never talked about it at this level before. So it's all new. So the support system is nil and we do need to have support for ourselves. So we can, we can live and we can manage. I, I know in your submissions you have a number of requests to the committee about um, um, support for travel costs and stuff like that and also a specialist tracing service um, appropriate re reparation to enable the community to seek relief from poverty and stuff also um, um, you're talking about um, post-traumatic slave syndrome again when I read that it, it just uh, I, I, I just couldn't believe I was reading it, you know, I was yeah. awful. Maybe you, I don't know if you'd like to say anything about it or not, or, or maybe right. inform us about what it is. How yeah, it is. I think we'd like to, yeah, and I can help you. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, we had been, we literally compared all of our symptoms, we analysed our symptoms, we did our own impact statement, and we analysed our own symptoms, and we tried to articulate uh, a way to describe how we felt on a day-to-day -day basis and as Carla was saying my own master's degree is in social policy politics stuff like that so I'm always tuned into all these political concepts and we have learned a lot about race from the UK but more importantly from America it's the obvious place the African-American experience and one thinks that although we've come from Ireland, the experience is not that similar, but it's remarkably similar because the common denominator is racism. And the, 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 this uh, uh, Joy de Groo, 2005, she came up with this post-traumatic slavery syndrome. And the, the symptoms of that just so mirrored how we felt. It was the low self-worth. And I've spoken very briefly about what that means. It's about our, how we see ourselves internally and then you've got your self-esteem which is how you think people see you externally and then you have the helplessness you have the rage you have the expectation you will never you will never amount to anything and I listened to Dr. De Groo and I was going my goodness that's us that's us. And it really was that simple, Chair, sort of coming across this framework, which to us adequately explained the symptoms that we as a community endured on a day by day. So that is why we refer to our particular trauma as post-traumatic slave syndrome. Not post-traumatic stress disorder, but post-traumatic slave syndrome. Many of us will have other disorders, depression, anxiety, 
uh, a, a hypervigilance, all of that. But there's another element which is entirely attributable to the racism. Um, I think we're we're kind of done on this. You want to come back in at this stage? And yeah, I just want to ask you, and I don't know whether whether you will know the answer at this point. Um, I mean, clearly, this is your first port of call. Your first, you know, the uh, I suppose way of highlighting the issues right at this justice, justice committee, and. I suppose what I want to ask is, where do you go from here? What are you going to do next? Perhaps, and just as if I may, could I suggest, uh, Deputy Ferris, that if you would be interested in, in, in acting as a liaison between the group and the committee. And there are lots of issues here that need to be progressed forward. And, and perhaps that, yes. if you were to act as a liaison, if you were willing and able to do that, you could bring suggestions to us that we might actually then pass on to government, minister and other agencies and, and maybe kind of work that way. Would that be appropriate? That, that, that sounds, I mean, that sounds a, very, a very good idea, Chairman, because there are a number in your submission, there are a number of issues that you raise yeah, exactly. you know, in relation to the CERD and different things that the and we have a fantastic report with, with, with Deputy yeah, Anne. So we would, up there, I can tell yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, we have a, yeah, so yeah. could we perhaps work on that basis and, and, and that, um, the, the, um, maybe to take some issues one at a time and work incrementally to get to move on and, and to get, 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 get heightened awareness and, and get some of, of, of your, your, your um, requests kind of met, including possibly a meeting with the minister mm -hmm. and, and people like that. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and because I, I must admit, I wasn't aware of, of any of this until it was brought to my attention. Couldn't be. No, I mean, as I said, aware. yeah, no. So, no. I, so I mean, it's been an yeah. education thing yeah. for all of us yeah. today, and, and I hope media are taking note as well, and that people will actually. Yeah. And I know what the language you use is not language of blame. Mm. You're looking forward to the future. Yeah. And Abs absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Which is refreshing. You're yeah. not yeah. looking back in a kind of a negative, blame way. Looking forward to the future, trying to get move forward, and forward which is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. So I think, at the, yes, yeah. you want to finish up? Yeah, thank you, thank you and for your interjection, which is uh, great. But what I, w I was going to say also, and you mentioned the media there, and I do hope that the media who cover the committee proceedings in Leinster House are picking up on this uh, debate here uh, this afternoon. But I would urge you, you know, because you are the voice now for so many people. You don't have that amount of people in your organisation, but you, there are other people out there, and you are the voice for those people. And I would urge you to, to try and bring it further, you know, to try and perhaps, and I know it, how difficult it is and how upsetting it is, but perhaps to maybe to, to seek the, you know, to, to go on the national airwaves on it, on, on television and that at a, an opportunity, because it's a little bit like the Philomena Lee story. That's what, so, you know, changed people's hearts and got through to so many people to see the human angle and the and that's what I and I, I but I do know how difficult it is yes. for you. You did mention that m many fathers were um, uh, doctors and solicitors and, yes. and, and, and engineers and so forth. H has there been any kind of contact or tracing or in that area at all? No, or is it possible or desirable? Or? Uh, it's often an individual one to one, you know, whether okay. someone wants to do that or not. Um, a lot of the issues that the nuns kept very bad records. Yes. In fact, would often the names were often, you know, misspelled or yes. so. So it would be interesting to, to maybe have to. This feeds into the question about research. Yes. If we had some, you know, to be able to trace, we could, as part of the research, find out how many of those actually did go on to find their their, their heritage fathers. But also, one of the things that we ask in in our asks, I know we're going to talk further and on a one, more on a one to one, but the idea that we would return to some of these, some of some of our fathers countries mm. that most of us have actually completely denied i know I'm, yeah. I'm incredibly uncomfortable with the idea that my father happened to be from ghana and i, I may have do i want to go there actually no but however part of that healing process and i do want to emphasize that word this isn't about blame this is about healing inclusion yeah. and learning it's a learning opportunity yes. for society because the painful lessons we disclose can actually be turned into a positive for a more equitable society, and 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 I think Yvonne just wants to yes. highlight one thing here, which she 
is keen to just do Thank it. Thank you. This is, um, I ask that, our, or we ask that our unique stories be told by us in our own words. We ask our stories and personal injuries not to be benefited by solicitors, media, and be sensationalised for radio and television. We ask our stories be reported with the utmost respect for our community. Okay. Well, I, I hope Anne has echoed that. I yes. know that it would, is, be, it's would be respected. Yes. I would ask that be respected by all, everybody mm. involved. Mm. Um, you, you did actually um, so you give us, you give us a, a number of presentations, and, and I just want to know what's okay, what's okay to publish. Um, okay. The, uh, there was one entitled The Inequality of Treatment Based on Race Within the Care of State Institutions. Uh, is this this this, this, Irish, this one submission? There's a submission on it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah that's fine. Yeah, but that's fine. There's we, one that's, it's, it's a, it's a it's, it's, it's one Irish submission to the, uh, that one. Presentation on it. The presentation notes are fine. I mean, they're just notes. <laughs> um, there, there are two of them are private and confidential, actually. One, one which is research position yeah. paper. Campaign. I put private and confidential really as a kind of like, to kind of err on the side of sensitivity. So where, where are we with this? Do we, no, we, get back. we don't want back. that published, okay. We, we, no. And then there's a there's position, position, get back. position paper. Yeah. Position okay. paper. Yeah, the another, position paper is probably the most sensitive and probably the one that we would be most another, reluctant to There's another one, mixed race submission to the Iraq Committee and it's topic the inequality of treatment based on race under the care of state institutions. That's also yes. marked by staff. Oh, the, so that, that's the submission. Okay. Yes, we're happy with that. That's private, private and confidential is marked with that as well. But we're happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's just to err on the side of caution when we were okay. transferring yeah. it by, by you can, email. You can with the clerk anyway, just in case it gets sure. into the wrong inbox. We finish. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I think we are, we, are, we are done. Just for your information, we hope to have hearings in the new year on uh, racism, culturalism, and, and um, integration. We've had a lot of submissions on that topic. We've been extraordinarily busy. We've had 21 reports so far in the last number of years in this committee, but this is one that's on the agenda. Hopefully in the new year, early in the new year, we hope to have hearings on that and do a paper on it, a report on it before. So we invite you to keep an eye on that possibly, and maybe yeah. we might even include some of your work here on that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, then, I just want to, again, thank you very, very much for being here today. And, and um, sorry. Okay, yeah. Um, and for your engagement with the committee members on this topic. Uh, and, and we've had a lot of, in, of groups with here in the last number of years, and this has been, I think, one of the most impressive we've had. We've had a lot of impressive people and groups here, but we're, I'm really impressed and taken and moved by what I've heard and what I've read. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much indeed. Thank you. So, um, and we will bring this, if, if colleagues are in agreement, to bring this discussion to the attention of the Minister and forward the transcripts and, and, and so on uh, as well to see if we can... Um, if we can okay, so thank you very much for being here today. We're going, now going to private session for a few minutes to discuss some housekeeping matters and, and hopefully it won't be too long. <laughs>